Hello, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, State of the Risk, an Objects at Heights webinar, sponsored by Ergodyne. My name is Kyle Morrison. I'm the Senior Associate Editor with Safety and Health Magazine, and I'll be moderating today's session. Thank you for joining us. We'll start the presentation in a few minutes, but first I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. The views of the speaker and his organization are his own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health Magazine. Mention of any commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or the magazine endorse them. At the end of today's webcast, we'll have a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply type it in the text box located in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, then click the Submit Question button. Feel free to ask your question at any point during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the Q&A session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, but due to the large number of participants, not all questions may be answered. However, all unanswered questions will be forwarded on to today's speaker. For basic troubleshooting information, please click the Help button located on your screen. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete an evaluation survey, and I'll talk a little bit more about that after the presentation. This webcast will be archived for three months, so you can access it after today's live presentation. Within about a day, just return to this URL to view the archived webcast. Okay, with that, I think we're ready to begin. Our speaker today is Nate Bomback, the Senior Product Manager at Ergodyne. For the last 10 years, Nate has developed innovative at height safety products and taught best practices to multiple industries. Nate? Hey, thanks a lot, Kyle. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we'd like to begin. Again, our topic today is Objects at Heights, Awareness and Solutions. We're going to talk a little bit about the state of the risk category. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So let's discuss first uh, a, an agenda of what we're going to cover. We'll start with a brief introduction, uh, followed by a look at safety at heights as an overview uh, from a 5,000-foot view, if you will. Uh, then we'll get into the risk awareness, the costs associated with those risks, and then discuss some controls and best practice around those. Uh, and then we'll wrap it up at the end before we start our Q&A. So as I said, let's start with a safety at heights overview and take a look at this category as a whole. So I would venture to guess that most of you on the line do some work at heights. You'll learn a little bit later that we're not, uh, not talking specifically about at heights work, but the majority of this is referring to at heights. So we look at that category as safety as a whole, and we can break that down into workers at height and objects at heights. Workers at height on the left side of this hierarchy is where the majority of the focus is today and where it should be. Under workers at height, you have categories like fault protection solutions, other forms of personal protective equipment, and then access solutions, how workers are getting to and from heights. But what's often an afterthought, and a lot of times not even a thought, is the right side of your screen, and that is objects at heights. In order to, if you safely manage objects at heights, you're going to have less concern with workers at heights. So let's break these down a little bit further. So when looking at workers at heights, again, the three categories can be further broken down. You have your fall protection solutions, which can be broken into active and passive systems. For example, a passive system in fall protection may be guardrails or something of the like, whereas an active system are going to be what is generally termed as your ABCs of fall protection, which is your anchors, your body support, and your connectors. So these two items can be broken in uh, broken off from fall protection solutions. Then in the middle, we have other personal protective solutions. And this is taking a look at standard PPE, traditional PPE, and deciding, determining if it needs to take on a new look or a new design if being used at heights. As an example, your traditional work gloves, do they need to take on you know, more grip or more dexterity if they're being used at heights? and uh, rope is being used as an example, or, or particular climbing is being used. Another example might be temperature control or proper hydration. So hydrating workers at heights is a little bit more challenging than hydrating workers on the ground. So looking at this category uh, is very important as well to determine if traditional practices uh, still are in play when used at height. 
And then on the far right, you have access solutions. Access solutions are how those workers are getting to and from height. So are they using ladders? Is a lift being involved? Uh, or is rope access being invo involved, for example? So then what's equally, if not more complex then, is objects at heights. And if we break this down as well, we can see a lot of similarity in almost a reflective manner uh, as workers at heights. So where workers at heights have fall protection solutions, objects at heights have dropped object prevention and solutions. So this too, as you will see, can be broken down into passive and active systems. So we term our subject matter objects at heights management, but dropped objects is kind of the hot term that's being used out there when you talk about the risks associated with this. We like to talk about this in a broader sense, uh, which dropped objects, just like fall protection is to workers at heights, dropped objects is the majority of the conversation when you're talking about objects at heights management. So, but in addition to that, you have housekeeping solutions. So this is keeping a properly organized workspace when at height. It could include cord management practices, tool organization, gear organization, and the like. And then again, just like with access solutions for workers, you have equipment transportation solutions for objects. And that could be, is a worker carrying it up? Or is a worker hoisting it up? Also could be involving a crane if, if so chosen. So the first thing to be uh, concerned about is just general awareness. This is where we start the conversation in a very basic sense. Because this has been known as a, an emerging issue, which we'll see a little bit later, is not necessarily true, we like to talk about awareness to start. And let's start with an elementary definition of what dropped objects are. Dropped objects are, it's easy, it's any object that falls from its previous position. So it typically considers workers themselves, though, as a separate category. That's the fall protection uh, category of safety. But one of the takeaways here, even though that's a very basic uh, definition, is that an object falling from its previous position could be just about anything. It could be small hand tools uh, and, and parts, components, hardware, things like that, which are the traditional things people think about. But it also could be things that don't necessarily come to mind right away, like your own personal protective equipment. Um, could be big pieces of equipment or structure um, or any other loose items. So as you see in the photographs there, could be that smaller shackle or it could be a huge boom of a crane. Um, it, and that's a little bit eye-opening when you consider all of that under this definition. The drops organization, which we'll touch on a little bit later, breaks these objects, uh, dropped objects into either static dropped objects or dynamic dropped objects. To break this definition down a little bit further, static dropped objects is any object that falls from a stationary position. So as an example, that megaphone or, or floodlight you see there, if that bracket were to corrode and that megaphone were to fall under its own weight, that would be considered a static dropped object. Conversely, a dynamic dropped object is something that has a secondary force involved when it falls. So anything that is kicked or being used or some other forces at play to create that dropped object is fall, falls under the dynamic uh, consideration. And dynamic dropped objects are certainly the most common. So let's take a look then at what causes dropped objects. So the causes of dropped objects, there are many of them, but they can be broken into two categories either caused by various elements or worker or equipment generated. So the elements, as an example, if when we ask this in our training efforts, uh, what types of elements cause dropped objects, the common, uh, common answers are weather-related. So wind, rain, snow, things like that. 
Um, so environmental conditions certainly can cause it. But one thing to consider is that if those aren't direct causes, these environmental conditions can cause secondary effects. For example, corrosion or other deterioration. The example we used on the previous slide where that bracket corroded and that static dropped object occurred from that megaphone, that is a secondary uh, cause based on an environmental thing of you know, corrosion, corrosion occurring. Uh, and then you could have vibration effects for, let's, if anybody's on the line that uh, works on offshore rigs or anything like that, um, sea motion or vibration from machinery, things that, that can cause uh, vibration or other movement to occur. Environmental conditions in terms of temperatures can also affect the worker's body. As an example, uh, hot weather could cause sweaty palms or, or things like that to, that would affect grip. Uh, and cold weather, conversely, could cause numb fingers and hands, and that could affect the grip. So these are all elements-related uh, causes of dropped objects. Worker or equipment-generated causes include simple accidents like tripping or, or collision or things like that, um, or as a result could be negligence from things like poor housekeeping, not following procedures, miscalculations or uh, missed inspections or things like homemade tools and equipment. And I'm sure none of you have ever seen a homemade tool on the job site. That never happens, does it? Uh, so these are worker equipment generated causes. If we think back to that, that hierarchy and we talked about dropped objects, now let's look a little bit closer at housekeeping at height. So poor housekeeping could be uh, your standard definition of housekeeping, an unorganized, unclean workplace that can lead to a number of issues. But when that work site is at height, it can lead to different issues or more severe issues. As an example, if you have a poorly kept work site at height, you're causing your workforce to spend unnecessary time at height and move around at that at height uh, workstation uh, more. So, that can lead to, as we know, the more time spent at height, the more uh, time there could be for an issue or an accident to occur. So that could be a result of uh, poor housekeeping. Also think about trip hazards like cord management, those laying across platforms and scaffolding and things like that. Uh, on the ground, that could lead to a, a slip or trip. Uh, at height, that could lead to a slip or trip and result in a fall from height. So we want to pay attention to that as well. And then the final category is something we will talk about a little bit later as well. But we also talk about foreign material and foreign object concerns. So this is where it branches into the realm of same level work zones in addition to ad height work zones, is issues that can occur from foreign material uh, coming into play. And again, we'll touch on that a little bit later. And then that final uh, category we talked about on the hierarchy is safe equipment transportation. So improper uh, transportation of equipment could lead to not, maintain, not maintaining three points of contact. Also, if a worker is trying to put everything on their body to climb to height, which often happens because they don't want to forget anything on the ground, this can result in overloading a climber, which can result in an extra physical toll on the body, or it could result in a larger worker adding more equipment to their body and then exceeding the fall protection capacity that they have on their equipment. So these are a couple considerations that you might not think of when you talk about objects at heights management. Uh, the second could be, let's say a worker chooses to hoist the equipment. Let's make sure that that container used for hoisting is not overflowing um, and or the classic example of the five gallon pail being hoisted up to height, making sure that our containers are properly rated for hoisting. So these are definitions and uh, you know quick awareness overviews of those three categories. Now let's talk about the costs of not taking action in this regard. And we break these into three categories 
uh, on their, uh, by themselves. The first is injury or fatality. The second could be damage. And the third being lost productivity. Let's look at each of those a little bit closer. So from injury or fatality standpoint, we talk about injury or fatality that could occur from dropped objects. And the most obvious one is a worker or bystander below being struck by a falling object. But a not so obvious one is to think about the people who are at height working as well. So when you talk about dropped objects, most people are focused only on the people below as at risk. But those working with that equipment at height are also at risk. Put yourself in this situation. You're working at height and you drop a hand tool uh, that you are using. What is your immediate gut reaction to dropping that tool? If it is if it's to try to catch it, that's absolutely what I would do as well. Even if you're sitting at a desk and you drop a pen off the desk, a lot of times your gut reaction is to try to quick react and grab that. Well, if that happens at height, that could lead to that worker falling and throwing themselves off balance. Also, if let's say the worker is actually doing their due diligence and they're tethering that tool, but they're tethering that 20-pound sledgehammer to the harness or belt. What happens if that 20 pound sledgehammer is dropped? Whatever it's anchored to is going with it and that anchor ends up being the worker. So these are things to consider as well. So those are dropped objects, potential injuries. There also are potential injuries from poor housekeeping and transportation, which could be slips, trips, and falls from the same level or from height. It also could be sprains or strains, getting back to overloading a climber, for example. Uh, and bringing this whole thing full circle, we could be talking about poor housekeeping and improper transportation practices leading to falling objects. As an example, a poorly kept workplace probably has tools and uh, debris littered across the platform. Well, that's easily going to be kicked off that platform and now become a falling object. So it, in a sense, brings this thing full circle and wraps all three of these things into one. So let's look at some statistics. First, let's start in the, in the US. In 2013, there were 509 fatalities from being struck by an object or equipment. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics has a category of struck bys. And this includes struck by flying object and struck by falling object, and then a number of other subcategories underneath that. So there were a total of just over 500 of those fatalities in the US from that struck by category. Nearly half of those, 245 of those fatalities, were caused by a falling object. And that's up by four from 2012. And in 20 11, that number was significantly lower. So we're seeing the unfortunate trend of this risk category growing. This represents just over 5% of all workplace fatality in the US. So those numbers are rather eye-opening. So to put a cost associated with this, even though when we talk dollars, it doesn't matter as much when we're talking about an individual not coming home at night. But to try to put a dollar value um, to get your management teams to put a program in place for dropped objects and objects at heights prevention, we have a medically consulted injury of about $40,000. So that's to say if there's an injury that occurs on the work site that a medic or something, a work stoppage occurs and there's some uh, consulting that needs to happen, it's about $40,000 of direct costs. Now, if a fatal accident were to occur, the NSC estimates that number to be $1.42 million uh, per fatality, and that's of direct costs only. Uh, that's not taking into account any indirect costs. So if we do the math and take that 245 times the 1.42 million, we're looking at an estimated direct cost of $348 million for US companies in 2013, which is a lot of money. So 
so for our friends north of the border in Canada in 2013, they had just over 8,600 injuries from being struck by a falling object, 23 of which were fatal. And in Canada, that represents about 2.5% of all workplace fatality. And I don't know if we have any friends from the South Pacific on the line, uh, but we do put this number up there because it's very eye-opening. Um, in Australia in 2013, there were 24 fatalities from being struck by a falling object. This represents 13% of workplace fatality. And what is the most staggering stat and is not equivalent in the U.S. or Canada or other parts of the world is that there were also 24 fatalities from falling from height. So in Australia, they have a little bit more specific uh, specific regulation around this because their fatality rate is equal to that of falling from height, which is pretty, pretty crazy. So then we look past injury or fatality and talk about, let's say it doesn't hurt anybody um, or hit anybody, but what could happen from a damage standpoint to equipment? Well, there's five different things that can be damaged by a falling object other than individuals themselves as a re result of injury. And the first is that dropped item itself. So I know some of you use some very expensive equipment um, to take measurements and uh, do alignment and things like that at height. Um, so that dropped item itself could be extreme. One example that came up was using torque wrenches at height. And every time, talking to this individual, every time a torque wrench was dropped, it cost the company approximately $250 to recalibrate that torque wrench. And they estimated they were dropping about 10 torque wrenches a week. So those numbers start to add up quickly. The second one is an object below. So let's say you're working at height and it falls onto a, a car or something of that nature. The third one then is the structure being worked on. So many of you on the line probably work in industries where uh, let's say you're maintaining aircraft or other transportation um, and things of that nature. Let's say something drops and damages that aircraft. Um, or those of you working in the solar industry, if there's anybody on the line, damaging those panels you're working on. And other sensitive surfaces need to be looked at. Uh, then we have equipment from foreign objects. So we mentioned this before. So FME and FOD are two terms, acronyms used throughout various different industries. FME stands for Foreign Material Exclusion, and FOD stands for Foreign Object Damage or Disposal. So that is loose items and other things getting into places where they shouldn't be that can cause systems, machinery, things like that um, to shut down or get clogged up. And a classic example is the airline industry. FOD is huge in the airline industry. FME is the term used in nuclear industry, for example, for things being dropped into cooling reservoirs and things like that. Um, so dropped objects, as small as they might be, could lead to much, much bigger issues in terms of damage. And then the final one is the environment. So if nothing happens, nothing's damaged, it could be a matter of just littering in our environment. And then the final one is lost productivity. So this could be a work stoppage to investigate a near miss, or it could simply be a worker working at extreme height and them dropping the tool they need to do the job, then having to climb all the way back down to retrieve that tool or replace that tool, and then climb all the way back up to complete the task. That's a lot of time lost. In terms of what industries this is an issue, it's hard to find an, an industry where this might not be an issue. The classic examples are those industries that many of you are a part of that work at height. Utilities, telecommunications, construction, uh, other energy um, type industries. But one takeaway here is to consider that it's not just at height's work where objects at heights management is important. Dropped objects and falling objects can be an issue at any level. As an example, we have some of those industries where FME and FOD are major issues on the slide here. 
nuclear, manufacturing, food processing, transportation. Or we take a look at industries where you know, underwater or confined space applications are, are uh, apparent. So as an example, let's say somebody drops something into a confined space. Well, now many of you have to go get a permit issued for confi confined space entry to go down and retrieve that, and that can lead to hazards in and of itself as well. So that's a very quick uh, overview of the category as a whole. Let's talk then about controls and best practice and what we can do to help mitigate these risks. At Ergodyne, when we do training, we teach everything within the hierarchy of controls. So the hierarchy of controls starts with uh, your ability or of potentially eliminating uh, a risk. And so many of you safety professionals on the line, elimination and substitution, the top two, are not usually uh, available. So we focus on engineering controls, administrative controls, and personal protective equipment, the bottom three. So we're looking at either isolating people from the hazard, teaching them about the hazard, or protecting them with personal protective equipment. So personal protective equipment then, within this conversation, we define as secondary protection solutions. This protects or covers a worker um, and maybe perhaps deflects if an object uh, has already fallen. So this is where, coming back to a point uh, I made earlier about many people considering dropped objects and objects at heights as an emerging issue, our comeback to that is, how long have you been wearing hard hats? And the answer is usually decades. So what is a hard hat in place to prevent, or I should say protect from? It's dropped objects, correct? So it's not an emerging issue. What's emerging is the controls that are being put in place to help protect workers from this. So classic traditional PPE, like hard hats, steel-toed boots, protective eyewear, and even dorsal protection on the back of a glove, these are in place so that it will help minimize the damage occurred if something falls and hits a worker. So administrative controls then, these are controls used to try to adjust the behavior or get people to think about it and be aware of it. So the definition here is changing the behavior of our workers and our individuals. And we do this through two different methods. The first is spreading awareness and communicating. This could be through things like posting signage and giving hard hat stickers away or putting up barricade tape around zones. Um, it could also be taking this to a toolbox talk or a pre-shift discussion uh, and then doing webinars and attending things like we're doing today, which is spreading awareness through training. The second method then is uh, putting in place policies and procedures. This could be pre-job and post-job checklists to make sure, for example, everything that is taken to height comes back down from height. It also could be putting zonage on a work site, so creating red zones or drop zones around a particular area where work is being performed at height. It also could be hoisting versus carrying procedures. Many tower companies and wind companies put in place procedures that uh, their workers have to hoist everything up and can't carry anything on them. So these are different examples of this. So then we look at engineering controls uh, as a, the final one under our definitions here. So as mentioned previously, this is where the emerging part of this subject matter is really coming out. The engineering controls now available to help prevent dropped objects, that's what's new to our world. And for engineering controls, an objects at heights definition is all about prevention. We're aiming to prevent objects from falling. Okay? So this can be broken into two types, passive engineering controls and active engineering controls. Passive engineering controls do not require active participation from the worker. 
So as an example we used for fall protection, these are guardrails. They are there and the worker is working around them. Active engineering controls, on the other hand, are actively being used by the worker. So let's take a look at some examples. So for passive engineering controls, these are things put in place like tow boards, netting, uh, barricades, and even if you can see that small static tether uh, in the middle photo, secondary retention, that's backing up a primary thing holding a piece of equipment or a tool with a secondary retention method. So these are all things that are put up uh, that workers can work around, and if something were to fall or drop, these are going to prevent them from falling to levels below. So active controls, then, are things like tool lanyards, connectors, top containers, things like that, that the workers are actively participating with and, and touching and using throughout the workday. So just like with a harness, lanyard, um, and anchored points uh, for fall protection, these are what workers are, are using and actively participating with. So the question always comes up, so what do the regulators say about this? Well, the answer is not a lot uh, because they say plenty about a lot of the PPE that should be put in place, but not a ton because it's an emerging category of the engineering controls, the active and passive systems uh, that can be put into place. OSHA mentions uh, it in three areas, uh, scaffolding section, uh, all three under the construction standard, scaffolding section, uh, fall protection, and then steel erection, where they use terms like protection from falling objects. Only in the steel erection section do they mention anything about uh, prevention, you know, securing loose items aloft. But we always have the general duty clause, which essentially states that if there is a known risk, and there are known solutions available to mitigate that risk, that those should be put into place. Well, everybody on the line uh, knows that there's a risk, and we are now or will know of the different solutions that can be put into place. So OSHA could very well fall back onto the general duty clause in this circumstance. In Canada, there are, there are also three specific mentions, um, but they are under three very specific applications, including machine operating. Uh, so there's not a lot of detail in CSA standards. And to show you the confusion um, and why this is such an emerging part of the conversation, uh, a number of years ago CSA uh, uh, released an article called Protect Your Head that says hard hats are the only piece of equipment that can protect you against these risks. And as you'll see by the end of the presentation today, that is absolutely not true. There are plenty of other ways to help protect you against this. An organization that has emerged uh, over the last five, six, seven years or so is an organization affectionately uh, termed DROPS, which actually is an acronym for Dropped Object Prevention Scheme. They are focused on preventing dropped objects, specifically in the oil and gas industry, um, and particularly in the offshore oil and gas world. Now, that being said, a lot of the practices and a lot of the good tools and information that this organization uh, has out there can be taken and put into a number of different industries. So their goal is to get together and help spread best practice and pre best practice, excuse me, and awareness about these risks. There's over 130 members worldwide, and you'll see some of them on the next slide. And you can find out more information. I encourage you to do so. They have a phenomenal website at www.dropsonline.org. It's a brief snapshot of the 130 members, uh, which Ergodyne is a part of. Uh, but you'll see this is made up mostly of end user and training companies um, that get together and talk about this in various different regions around the globe. So now that we've defined these controls and solutions, let's look at some examples of specific solutions. We already touched on personal protective equipment, 
in hard hats, steel toe boots, and, and the like. So let's focus the rest of the presentation on an administrative controls and engineering controls. So administrative controls is some examples of um, some signage and barricade tape, hard hat stickers, training information that's available, white papers to help you educate. Um, there's a number of good resources out there for this. Um, so uh, Safety and Health and the Ergonine, let us know if you want any of this information. Policies and procedures. I mentioned drops. Here's some examples of some of the documents that they have available for download on their website um, that you can review and, and, and look at for your own job site. Um, task planning, uh, before start, what to do before starting work, while you're working, um, different lift plans, and so on. So then under engineering controls, we're going to focus the rest of the way on active engineering controls. You saw some examples of passive controls, but we'll focus our attention the rest of the way on active controls. So where fall protection has their ABCs of fall protection, we define active engineering controls with the three T's, and that's trapped, tethered, and topped. Trapping captures a connection point on tools and equipment that don't have them built into it that allows you to tether, which prevents an object from falling by securing it to an anchor point. And then the final one is topped, and that's making sure that loads are tied down and that all the containers being used for hoisting have some type of a top on them. So let's look first at trap. So many people are starting to put tethering into their everyday at height work practices. The problem is most of the tools and equipment that are being used don't have convenient connection points uh, for them to be tethered to. So until tool companies, um, which some, some are absolutely starting to do, but before tool companies take all their tools and put a clean tether point into them, uh, and then our end users decide that they have hundreds of thousands of dollars to replace all the tools that are out in the field, retrofit connections may be needed in order to create safe connection points on tools. So systems are in place to take those tools on the far left that are open-ended or have a neck or waist on them and use a series of retrofit connections uh, that are now available to capture a connection point onto a tool that you can then tether with. The result then is a complete at heights ready tool set for all the tools that you have available. Uh, now we like to keep product out of this presentation, uh, but we always do get asked what are some of the innovative solutions out there, and you can see some of them on the screen. There's new solutions for power tools, for tape measures, um, for non-traditional things, uh, you know, C-clamps that aren't necessarily hand tools, uh, but still need to go at height and still can be a dropped object concern. So there are various different solutions available. We're not going to touch on them all in detail today, but please do follow up if you would like more information. Then the second T is tethering. So with tethering your tools, there's a few factors to consider. Uh, I, would, I would compare tool tethering today to what fall protection practices were 30 years ago. Uh, and there are a lot more solutions out there. The old classic example of the body belt and the rope being tied to the body belt as a fall protection system is a lot of what people are doing today. Taking a shoelace or a string or a small piece of paracord and duct taping or taping that to a tool. That's what's being done out in the field today. But a few things to consider. Number one is capacity. Is the weight of the item being tethered, does that 
is that going to end up breaking whatever tethering system is being used? Uh, second is connectors. What type of connection is needed for that tool? And then the third is clearance, reach, and snag hazard. So how much reach does an individual need to be, over, be able to perform the job? Uh, and conversely, if there's a long lanyard to give that user that reach, is there a snag hazard at play here? So it's finding a happy medium, and there are new solutions available um, that accomplish both. So we look at tool tethering. So there are various different types of tethers available that go beyond your shoelace and duct tape. Uh, we ha there are retractable tethers available out there. There are heavy-duty lanyards available. Uh, and there are shock-absorbing tool lanyards available out there that help reduce the, sh the force seen by the worker if that tool is tethered to their body. So there, that is actually something that needs to be considered when you're working at height in tool tethering. If clearance uh, is an issue in that you don't want a tool to fall and hit something that you're working on, a wrist lanyard might be a good option for you. So there are different types of solution based on those considerations we looked at in the previous slide. Also something to consider is that we're not just talking about hand tools here. We're talking about tethering everything that's going to height, and that includes your personal protective equipment and other things. So it might be your safety eyewear, your hard hat, your gloves. Uh, we talked about cord management when it came to housekeeping solutions. So these items might not hurt anybody if they fall, but now a worker above is working without their PPE, and that can cause an issue as well. And then the final T is top. So f for topping, few considerations here as well. Is, it, is a worker able to actually hoist the equipment instead of carrying it on their body? So you want to, if possible, limit the amount of weight on that climber's body to help reduce fatigue issues and sprains and strains and things of that nature. If it is decided that a worker needs to carry equipment, that equipment or container should always let them maintain three points of contact at all times. Then consider the type of equipment being used. Is it small parts or is it big pieces of scaffolding or other structure? Uh, that will help you choose what container to use. Then also the weight of the equipment. Again, the capacity is of concern here. The classic example is using a five-gallon pail to hoist up equipment to an at-height work zone. That wire handle on that five-gallon pail is not rated for what you're putting in that container. So that's important. And then finally, the material that that container is made out of, depending on the environment that you're working in. So for carrying options, make sure that there's a secure closure or top, and there are a variety of different options available. Uh, that include flap closures, drawstring closures, and even no hand operation closures in the form of a trap door on the top of a bag, like you see in the middle, where that trap door closes if it's inverted. So these are different unique options that can be used on the worksite. If it's determined that hoisting is available, look for weight rated containers, a lot of times in the form of a hoist bucket or in the form of a tool bag. Uh, make sure that those tool bags are rated, okay, uh, and that they have secure closures on them. And most importantly for all this equipment, again, the capacity of the containers and the lanyards and the connectors, um, the capacity of your three T's is the utmost important. So we recommend, if you're choosing equipment, to make sure that equipment is third-party certified and that there is a safety factor built into it. There are no standards for us as manufacturers to follow when making this equipment like there is with fall protection. So there are plenty of manufacturers out there that are not testing them with safety factors built in. So safety factors our recommendation is that with tool lanyards or anything that could fall dynamically, 
that that be tested to a two to one safety factor. And for buckets, bags, and other hoisting equipment, anything that is going to have a static load, that that's tested four to one. Okay, why is this so important? We'll use the example and let's compare it to fall protection. If I'm going to climb and I need to choose my fall protection equipment, I know how much I weigh, even though if I tell you out loud, I might shave off five or 10 pounds, but I know how much I weigh and I can match my weight to the fall protection label. With tools and equipment, even though we recommend you do so, there's going to be 90% of the time, if not more, that workers are just going to pick up that tool and attach it to a lanyard without even knowing how much that tool weighs. So there is an extreme high potential of misuse, which is why safety factors are so important. And look for that marking on the label of your equipment. If it doesn't have a marking on it, it shouldn't be used for at heights work. And then your final consideration, uh, it's your primary prevention to dropped objects. And that's your grip. So the hand protection being used um, and keeping your hands warm and cool in their respective environments, make sure you take care of your hands because that's going to help you hang on to the tools and equipment that you're using. So use gloves and uh, and everything with proper dexterity and proper grip, um, making sure that if, it's if you're using it in extreme hot or extreme cold temps, it has the respect of breathability or warming associated with it. So as we bring it to a close and open it up to Q&A, let's review one more time. So we have our summary. Objects at height safety should be part of every plan that you're putting into place for safety at heights. Secure people and the objects going to height. The plan should have drop prevention, housekeeping, and safe transportation practices in place. Use that hierarchy of controls, which many of you I know do, by implementing engineering controls in addition to administrative and PPE. And then an easy reminder, like the ABCs of fall protection, the three T's of objects at height safety, trapped, tethered, and topped. And finally, make sure your equipment is tested and tagged by the manufacturer. So with that, we'll bring up some questions, and I will kick it back to Kyle. Great. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Uh, before we start uh, the Q&A, I want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey I mentioned at the top of the hour. Uh, the survey should be appearing on your screen now, and we ask that you consider completing it to let us know your thoughts. Uh, your input is important because it helps improve future webcasts, so please do take the time to fill out the survey. If you don't see the evaluation survey on your screen, uh, please make sure your pop-up blocker is turned off. All right, let's, let's get into some questions right here. Um, do you find there was a lot of conversation about securing tools and, and using tethers and so forth and lanyards? Uh, do you find that lanyards could become a trip hazard or uh, cause some sort of entanglement issues? The, the answer is absolutely they can, and, it, and I would just like with fall protection, you see a movement towards uh, mini, miniature retractables and things like that because of this reason. Uh, lanyards can absolutely in particular applications can become a snag hazard. Depending on where you're anchoring it to, I don't see these becoming as much of a trip hazard, um, but a snag hazard, as you mentioned, Kyle, more, more specifically. So there are things like wrist lanyards, retractable lanyards, even coil lanyards um, that actually coil up to help minimize uh, the length that is hanging off of a worker or an anchor point uh, to help reduce that issue. Um, so yes, absolutely, they can beco become um, an issue. So I would just try out whatever lanyard you're going to put in place to make sure there aren't any secondary um, ill-intended effects. Great, thank that you. It cause that. Okay. How often should workers replace tool connectors? Is that something that, you know, do they have expiration dates on them? Great question. They do not have, well, speaking specifically from Ergodyne standpoint, other manufacturers may say different, but the majority of this equipment 
uh, does not have a specified life to it as long as it passes an inspection. Um, and there are inspection steps available for this equipment. Um, so that being said, with tool connectors, because of the use um, and because of the retrofit ability of them, we do recommend that um, there is a replacement cycle put in place, even though there isn't one specified in a standard per se. Um, and I guess our recommendations would be that if it's being used um, in a heavy use environment, like every day, um, then six months is probably a, a good measure. In lighter use, one year is probably a better way to look at it. But if that, that should be inspected before use, before every use, and then inspected at least monthly by a competent person to make sure there isn't any issue. And if it fails an inspection, it should be replaced. Okay, great. I um, wanted to ask, just in, in terms of regulation, is there anyone, and if so, who would be leading the charge in dropped object prevention? So not necessarily from a regulatory standpoint, because the DROPS Association isn't a regulatory body. But in terms mm -hmm. of best practices, even though they're, not, even though, uh, they're more specific to the oil and gas industry, uh, the DROPS organization has a lot of good best practice that I would imagine um, much of becomes some type of standard further down the road. Um, and then also Australia does a nice nice job with some of the way they lay things out. Um, so I think from a regional standpoint and then just a pure organizational standpoint, those are two good um, things to look at or places to look at. Okay, and uh, just a quick clarification. Did, did we hear you correctly that there are no regulations on containers in the in the top section? Uh, no regulations uh, specifically to um, this as dropped object prevention solutions, mm -hmm. correct. There are lots of hoisting regulations and standards for, um, you know, crane operation and loading and things like that. AS ME has some good information, um, but for a prevention of dropped objects in terms of anchor points and things like that built onto containers or, or putting a top on a container and then turning that upside down to make sure that that's properly secured, um, there are no regulations that I am aware of. Okay. You previously in the presentation discussed regulatory agencies um, for the U.S. and Canada, uh, but does Australia have any regulations for drops or drop object prevention? Uh, they do. They do. A good resource to check out what they have um, is www.safeworkaustralia.gov.au. Um, this, if you search falling objects uh, at this website, You'll find some good information um, in terms of what they do from a regulatory standpoint, and then they have some extra tools in that associated as well. So that's uh, safeworkaustralia.gov.au. Okay, great. Do you see a, a place uh, within Drops Objects for tearaway technology? And perhaps if you could uh, explain a little bit of what te tearaway technology is. Sure. So tearaway technology, it's looking at the balance um, between something that's meant to retain or uh, arrest something, and then the converse effect of that particular solution uh, being a snag hazard or uh, pulling somebody into, uh, let's say, machinery or into a, a, a sticky situation. Um, so that particular... Um, trade-off has always been a challenge both for fall protection industry and for um, the dropped object prevention industry in that the primary um, reasoning behind this safety equipment is to retain or arrest something from falling. Um, however, if used around moving parts and machinery and things like that, um, you want tear-away uh, leashes and things like that. So there's a trade-off depending on the situation. Um, so we've had requests for tearaway lanyards and things like that, and we always turn people to our lower rated lanyards um, that have a weak point on them that do tear away at a particular 
uh, particular force, if you will. But then you do have a trade-off of that not being as strong of a lanyard and that not being able to hold is highly of rated tools. So there's a balance there, and depending on the risk within that specific application, um, you'll have to determine what that balance is. Uh, but it's always on the top of uh, our minds, and I'm sh I, I know the fall protection community's mind as well. Okay. Could, could you talk a little bit more about snag hazards and, and what can be done to uh, minimize the risks presented by them? Sure. So. Snag hazards, a couple things, a couple new solutions available um, in the terms of coil lanyards and retractable lanyards. So as most often, uh, more often than not, I should say, the, these tools are going to be tethered to an individual. And by using a standard length lanyard, say three feet, that lanyard is then kind of dangling off of a worker. Um, and the snag, ha that worker is probably climbing um, in a lot of times in a confined space or in a tight area. Um, and then as that worker is climbing, those long length lanyards become snag points. Um, so they can get hung up on ladders and um, rebar and what, whatever it is that they're, they're crawling around. So s new solutions are available in the form of retractable lanyards, coil lanyards, um, and wrist lanyards to help reduce that snag hazard, but yet give you uh, an equal amount of you know, capacity for those solutions. So the nature of those lanyards then, do they extend and then retract in some way, shape, or form, so that when they're not being used while, used while a worker's climbing, it is more compact and lower profile on the body. Okay, great. Uh, we have time for, for one last question since we've been talking about working from height. Um, what, uh, at what height from the ground must um, workers use a personal fall arrest system? Personal fall arrest system or a dropped object? Uh, either. So for, remember back to my fall protection days, I think it's different for general industry and construction. And there is mm -hmm. uh, actually language for fall protection, but I will... I will punt the ball to my fall protection um, friends in the industry to that. But I think one is four feet and one is six feet, if I'm not mistaken. But again, okay. please contact your fall protection manufacturer um, to get that information. Now, from a dropped object or drop prevention standpoint, uh, there is no regulation that says you need to put this in place at a certain height. So what we like to say um, is that unless there is a risk, same level for dropped objects um, or damage that could occur, same level from dropped objects. I mean, if, I, if one of us drop a heavy hammer from our hand and it hits us in the toe, that could be on any level. But mm -hmm. a good, safe play, if you're putting a policy in place, is to do the same as your fall protection people to limit the confusion so that they know if they need to go to this particular height, everything should be tied off, workers and equipment. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, unfortunately, uh, we have run out of time. I apologize. There were several questions we didn't get a chance to get to, but um, for everyone whose question was not answered, uh, they are going to be forwarded on to Nate. Um, once again, I hope you take the time to fill out the survey, of, uh, to fill out the evaluation survey on your screen uh, to give us your feedback. And with that, that concludes today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. I'd like to thank Nate, Ergodyne, and all of you who listened in, thank you and have a great day. Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, everyone.